good to see you all. Matthew chapter 14 is going to be our text this morning. Matthew chapter 14, if you saw the, uh, my uh, uh, promo video on YouTube and you know, on the website for today, I, I learned last week of a survey, a recent survey, of young people who identified themselves as, as being liberal. Uh, politically, ideologically being liberal. And um, one of the aspects of that, uh, or findings of that survey, showed that these folks, these young people, are very anxious and fearful about the days in which we live, about the direction our country's going and the world and so on. And I, I want you to understand that it's not just young liberals, all right? Everybody is. Uh, the, I talk to people all the time, and it's like, wow, things are changing so rapidly. Uh, things are going in, in such a different direction uh, than, than what we're used to and what we've seen and how we've grown up and, and where are things going to end. Um, please understand that the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy 3.1, that in the last days perilous times will come. And the word perilous means hard to bear, troublesome, dangerous, harsh, fierce, savage. Hmm. Kind of sounds like we might be there or we are, we've cry, at least crossed the threshold, it seems. Jesus said this in Luke 21, 26. He said, in the last days, they will be characterized by this people's hearts will fail them for fear. For fear of the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Now I understand the tribulation period that the Word of God tells us about, the, 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 the days right before Jesus' second coming, are going to be unlike any other on the planet in all of history. The plagues that will come will make uh, Egypt and, and Pharaoh uh, and that whole time frame it, it look like summer camp. But I want you to understand that as we see our world and, and, and the things going on in our world, we can see that prophecy is, some of it has been fulfilled and some of it is being set up to be fulfilled. It's coming to pass. And the, the prophetic Words of Scripture will come to pass. Now, this idea here of being anxious, we even sang about it a little bit, right? The word anxious means to be filled with mental distress and uneasiness because of the fear of danger and misfortune. It means to be greatly worried. Kind of sounds like what people are wrestling with today. Our surroundings are unsafe. Our economy is unstable. Our leadership is untrustworthy. Our future is uncertain. Our world is going nuts. And it's easy to become anxious. The end time prophecies will happen, but I ask the people of God this, what are you afraid of? What are you anxious about? And why? Anxious about your money? Maybe what retirement might or might not look like? Maybe the social decline? Perhaps it's even persecution for living for Christ. All of which, by the way, will happen. But is that what is keeping you awake at night? I want you to read with me this story from Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. 
But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. I love verse 26 when it says, When they saw Jesus walking on the water, they were troubled. The English word doesn't do a great deal of justice to what these men were experiencing. Because the word here means to cause inward commotion, to take away the calmness of mind, to strike fear and dread. Folks, they were terrified. Now, I love the fact that John tells us about this story as well, but he doesn't mention Peter walking on the water, as does Mark. And John tells us that the boat was about three miles from shore at this time. Now, listen, three miles away from shore anywhere in a, in a, in a boat that isn't a huge boat, it's not like an ocean liner, in a storm is scary stuff. Because this was, this was, the storms coming down on the Sea of Galilee would whip up in a moment's notice, and they could be very fierce. And some of these guys were seasoned fishermen, and they were afraid. And you can well imagine they're fighting to try to steer this boat. They're, they're fighting to try to keep water out of it. They're, it's, it's in the middle of the, the night, right? The, the wee hours of the morning. And they've been struggling with this thing. And now they see somebody walking on the water. Don't know about you. I'd probably be a little terrified myself. Mark says that as they were out in the middle of the water... Jesus saw them from the side of the mountain. He didn't imagine them. He didn't feel that there was trouble. He saw them in the middle of the night. No lights out there, by the way. Right? He saw them three miles away struggling in this storm, and he went to them. To me, that's just so cool. But all three stories, John, Mark, and here in Matthew, all three contain this. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Now, there are three kinds of fear that plague us. I want to show you these very quickly. The first one is fear of the fictitious. It's unfounded. And that's what we find in verse 26. It's a ghost. I've never seen a ghost. I know people believe in ghosts. But that was the first thing that came to their mind. And we fear things that are unfounded, groundless, without foundation, created by our imaginations. Let me ask you this today. What are you worried about today? Personal. Political. Family, finances. What is it that is creating this anxiety in your heart and your mind? Chances are really good that it's all in your imagination. That it will never come to pass. Statistics show, surveys show, that 90% of the things we worry about never happen. 
But we conjure up these worst case scenarios, don't we? And we imagine, oh no, this is going to end this way. And we lose a lot of sleep. We take a lot of antacids. Visit the doctor, you name it. Fear of the fictitious. Then there's fear of the mysterious, the unknown. We want to know the outcome beforehand, don't we? We are excellent at walking by sight rather than walking by faith. We want the sure bet. Faith? Sounds risky to me. Follow the the word of God? Follow what what Jesus says? I I don't know. How's that all going to pan out? I don't know either. God does. I wonder sometimes how many people have not followed God's leading because of fear. Because they didn't know how it was going to work out. And I wonder how much could have been done for the kingdom of God had they walked by faith, not by sight. I remember when we first told my in-laws that I was going to go into the ministry. And I remember my father-in-law asking, well, are you prepared to live like church mice? As poor as church mice? By the way, that phrase originated in the 1600s. And supposedly, a mouse in the church, not going to have very much, right? You don't store a lot of food at church. And while that was not our goal to live like that, we said, well, whatever God has in store for us. And I remember getting ready to take my first pastorate, and leave uh, the position that I had at the Bible college and go uh, take that first pastorate. And I remember times of, of just excitement being offset by times of terror and anxiety because this was uncharted territory for me. But I can honestly tell you I'm glad that we walked by faith, not by sight. But the fear of the unknown will definitely cause us to become anxious, if we allow it to. And then there's the fear of the erroneous, the untrue, the untrue. We hear it. Sometimes in our heads, maybe even from other people. But things like, your problem is bigger than God. God can't do anything about that. Some people believe that. Or, your problem is too small for God. He's, not, he, he's got bigger fish to fry than that problem in your life. Right? He's, he can't be bothered with that. Or, God just doesn't care. I know some people who believe because they, they see the world, they, they believe that there's a God who created, but then he just wound it up and said, see you later. He is, a spirit in their minds, a spiritual, uh, uh, a cosmic deadbeat dad. That's it. You're on your own. All of those are lies. All of those are lies. Erroneous. How about lies like this? No one else has the same trouble I have. I know you've never, no one here has ever thought that, right? No one else is going through this. Newsflash, tons of people are going through it, and tons have gone through it. People in your very congregation have already walked through it, and the blessing is they'll be able to help walk you through it if 
you open up and let them. No one understands what I'm going through. Lie. That's a lie. How about this? Untrue. These statements. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I can't do anything right. No one will ever want me or love me. Lies, 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 lies. Lies. All of these types of fear, these are just categories. The specifics you know better than I in your own life and in your own heart. But God knows even better than you what they are, why you're afraid, why you're anxious, what's causing them. And he has the calm for your anxious heart. What is it? Here it is. Look at the screens. Jesus. Jesus. I want to give you, in the time that we have remaining today, three reasons why Jesus is the calm for your anxious heart from the text that we read today and, of course, the rest of the Word of God. But before I do, I want to just ad lib a little bit and encourage you to deepen your relationship with Jesus. You see, if you're not connecting to the Lord, if you're not deepening your relationship, if you're not growing in your walk with Jesus, I'm not talking about do's and don'ts, rules and regulations. I'm not talking about having an outward appearance of doing and being right. I'm talking about humbling yourself before God and lifting up your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Dear Jesus, I need you. I want to walk with you. I want to know you better. You know, the Apostle Paul said that I might know him in the, in, in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Well, Paul, you, you're the Apostle Paul. Yeah, I want to know him more, Paul said. And that was Paul's desire up until the very day that he died and he was so looking forward to going and being with Jesus. And I can guarantee you that as you grow in your relationship and in, in, in you, your heart is more knit together with the Lord Jesus Christ on a regular basis, boy, that longing will be the same. Lord, I just cannot wait to be with you personally, 100%, forever. No barriers. But we can have an intimate relationship with him here and now. And I think I said it last week, too many people trust Christ as their personal Savior, and that's great, got to do that, right? Because we're not saved by works, but by faith. It's, it's by, uh, by grace through faith, and it's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest anybody should boast, right? You can't earn your way into heaven. You can never be good enough. And if you could, what in the world is the cross all about? Why did Jesus come and die? He came to die because he was the spotless Lamb of God, God incarnate. Because only a perfect one could substitute himself for the sinful one and pay the penalty that we deserve, and rescue us from our sinfulness, and from the, the debt, and the eternal death that we earn because of sin. And the Word of God says that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to God's mercy that He saves us. 
And what we need to do is say, God, forgive me for my sins. Jesus, come into my life and save me from my sins. I'm trusting you and what you did on the cross for me. And I am not trusting me or anybody else, any other holy person, any other religion, any, anything, any church, not even this one. You. You. It's important. But there are a whole lot of people in our world today and in our country today who made that decision to to trust Jesus as their personal Savior, and and now they're just kind of sitting around waiting for heaven. I'm going to tell you something. If that's your case, if that's what you're doing, I can tell you you're going to be anxious. Because if you're not developing this relationship with Jesus and and living for him and living with him, you're kind of in this spiritual limbo and you're not fulfilling your purpose, the purpose that God has for you. So how is Jesus the calm for our anxious hearts? Well, the first way is this. He's present. I love this. I love this. In verse, verse 27, in the passage that we just read together, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Man, I'll tell you what. That should be a refrigerator magnet in your home, a bumper sticker on your car, a tattoo on the inside of your eyelids. <laughs> Be of good cheer. It is I literally, I am. Do not be afraid. I am. One of the great I am statements. Jesus used I am all the time. And he, he, he rattled the crowd. He rattled the religious folks because they understood I am was God in the burning bush to Moses when he said I am that I am I am the eternal all sufficient one and Jesus used that term over and over again about himself he said before Abraham was I am and they picked up stones to kill him because they said that's blasphemy no it was true God incarnate So now think about this. Jesus is God incarnate, and God is the I am, the all-sufficient, all-sustaining, everlasting one. And Jesus says, I'm with you. When we ask him to come into our lives and save us from our sins, he does exactly that. Revelation 3.20, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody opens the door, I will come in. I will come in. The Lord Jesus Christ, if you have said, Jesus, please save me from my sins. I'm trusting you. Come into my life. He's there. The Spirit of God lives within us. Jesus is with us. When he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he meant it. He cannot lie. And so not only does he does he he say don't be afraid, he starts it off with be of good cheer. Lighten up. Don't go over the edge. I am. I am. You know, sometimes storms come into our lives as divine tests. There are opportunities for Jesus to show himself mighty in our lives if we let him. And if we don't freak out, but we lean on him and let him work in our lives the work he wants to work. He wants to see if we'll walk by faith, not by sight. And then he wants to show us what he can do. I'll tell you what. (laughs) I've said this before, and I'm even thinking about 
a series. Lynn and I have story after story after story in our, in our lives of what the Lord has done. Just some incredible, amazing things. And it's not because we're anything special. It's because... <laughs> Why do the heathen rage? <laughs> Thank you, Carl. It's because he's good and he's gracious. And it's because he's true to his word. In the book of Exodus, chapter 16 and verse 4, God says this, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And in this way, I'll test them and see whether they'll follow my instructions. And do you know that even after Moses gave... Now, now this is Israel. They just saw what God, how God decimated Egypt and her gods through these plagues. They, they walked through the Red Sea... And now they're on the other side, and God says, I'm going to feed them with bread. They're going to take just enough in the morning. They're not to store it. It's just enough for every day for their family. And I'm going to test them to see if they'll follow my instructions. And you know that some of them still went out and tried gathering more? Well, man, you don't you don't know if this is going to show up tomorrow, so let's get another omer. Right? Let's get another. And, and we'll, well, you know what happened, right? Those of you who know the scriptures, God said if, if they do that, it's going to be awful in the morning. And sure enough, it was all infested with worms and it smelled no good. God says we need to walk by faith. Walk by faith. And we can because Jesus is with us. Jesus says, don't be afraid because I am with you. The second reason that he's the calm for our anxious heart is because he's sufficient. He's sufficient. I said this maybe a couple of weeks ago. I don't exactly remember when. There's a tremendous movement In Christendom, let's put it that way. And, and many call themselves Bible-believing Christians, but there's a tremendous movement today that wants to walk by sight rather than faith. And they have this idea that Jesus is... Our, our divine piggy bank, right? That he's just in the business of making us happy and giving us stuff. And people think that if I, if I start walking with God, if I trust God, I'm going to get all these perks, Right? That's, that's what this movement teaches. All you have to do is trust God and, and believe real hard. And boy, you're going to get all the perks. And I'm telling you this. Jesus is the perk. You make him the center of everything. Not what he can do for you. Not what he can give you. You make him the center. And see the joy that comes into your life from that. Oh, and by the way, he'll do some really cool things. He'll bless you in ways you, you've never imagined. 
But if you're going to follow him to get the stuff, you're not going to be happy. It's, it's not going to work. If you follow him to get more of him, he's the perk, and whatever does or doesn't come, it's all in his will. But because you are following the all-sufficient one, it's okay. It's okay if I don't have that new luxury car. It's okay if I don't get blessed with a, a, a multi-million dollar mansion. It's okay if I have to blow up the pool in the backyard and not have the built-in one poured. <laughs> right? It's okay. Because I've got Jesus. He is sufficient. In verse 29, so he said to Peter, come. <laughs> come. I love Peter. I mean, Peter, I can relate. All right? Open mouth, insert foot. <laughs> Take foot out, inspect foot, insert it again. <laughs> right? Sometimes, right? You know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was transformed in front of Peter, James, and John, and they were like, oh, they woke up and they were amazed, and Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let, let me build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses, right? And, and Mark says he said this because he didn't know what else to say. We do that. We just say stuff because we don't know what to say. The Proverbs tell us we're wise when we just don't say anything. And if we're really not wise, we're at least thought to be wise when we keep our mouths shut. <laughs> and so here comes, here comes Jesus walking on the water. Be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. It's, it's I. I am. And Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to walk on the water to you. And my thought is, what if it really was a ghost? What if it was some, some spirit pretending, kind of duping the guys, right? Oh, yeah. Come on. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Sure. Step out of the boat, Peter. <laughs> but Peter got out of the boat. And Jesus said, come. Jesus always says, come. He'll say, come. Because we're exercising faith in the all Sufficient one. The prophet Nahum wrote this The Lord is good, giving protection in times of trouble. He knows and cares for those who trust in Him. Isn't that cool? He knows and cares for those who trust in Him. It doesn't say those who believe in him. There are a whole lot of people in church at this very moment, in churches where, who believe in God. It says who trust in him because he's sufficient. He manages the entire world. He manages the solar system. The universe, you don't believe that? Here's what Paul wrote in the book of Colossians. By him, speaking of Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, are visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Jesus is holding it all together. Wow. And so, if he can hold it all together, he can manage our little world, can he? 
He can manage our little problems. Easy. One hand tied behind his back, not breaking a sweat. In fact, he knew it was coming before it came. And he had the answer to the problem before you had the problem. He knows how he's going to take care of it. So <clears throat> he is the calm for my anxious heart because he is present, because he is sufficient. And then I love this, because he's patient. He's patient. Some people get a little, I don't know, antsy. Oh, well, I, I lack faith. God can't be pleased with me. God could never work in my life. I just don't have enough faith. Jesus said if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, which is like the smallest seed, and it grows to be the biggest plant in the garden. He said, if you had faith that small, you could move mountains. I've never moved a mountain. He said, if you had faith that small, you could say to this tree, be uprooted and cast into the sea. What? I've never done that. I've never even tried. I guess I don't have that much faith. And yet the Lord is so patient with me and still honors the faith that I do have. I'm not going to try moving a mountain or plucking up a tree. But by God's grace, I'm going to try trusting him for more and more. And whether that was actual or hyperbole about the mountain and the tree, the lesson is this. You just need a little bit of faith, and God will honor it. And too many of us, because we're walking by sight and we're not walking by faith, are missing out on the blessings of God and the power of God in our lives, and we're living in anxiety and fear and dread. And it's not a fun place to be. Psalm 86, verse 15, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion, gracious and long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. That's a patient God. The word doubt means going two ways. Shifting between positions. And listen to this, it means choosing a double stance. You see, doubt is a choice. But here's what I love. That even when Peter saw Right, He took his eyes off of Jesus, he started looking at the waves, the wind was blowing, and, and he saw the commotion, and he started to sink, and he said, Lord, save me. It says Jesus caught him. Immediately he caught him. And that word literally means seized aggressively. I have a vivid imagination. I don't know if... Jesus was this far away from Peter or that far away from Peter, and I don't think it matters. I think Jesus was here and Peter was out there, and Peter began to sink and said, Lord, save me. Can somebody who walked on the water just skim it and, and be there on time, right? Sure, absolutely. The flash has nothing on Jesus. <laughs> Nothing. Okay? Sorry. But he's patient and he's good. The prophet Habakkuk preached during the last days of the southern kingdom of, of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel 
because of their wickedness and repeated rejection of God and his prophets had already fallen to the Assyrians. And now God sent Habakkuk to prophecy of Judah's impending Babylonian captivity because of their same sinfulness. And in the midst of predicting a fearful end to his nation, here's what the prophet declared. Though the fig tree does not blossom and there's no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout in exultation in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. The psalmist said, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. May we stand with the same fervor for Christ and the same confidence in his strong hand because that's the calm for our anxious hearts. Judging our brothers and sisters in Christ according to what we do or do not experience, our own experiences, puts us in the category of Job's friends who he called miserable comforters. Instead of scolding and correcting those who suffer from anxiety, pray with them. Encourage them to draw closer to Jesus and offer to be there for them whenever they need you. If anxiety is something you're struggling with, I'd like to pray for you right now. Father, we need your help. As our world seems to be crumbling around us, and the very foundations of righteousness and justice seem to be dissolving. Lord, help us to remember your word and help us to walk closely with the one who can save us even in the midst of stormy seas. And Father, I pray for the one listening today I'm praying directly for that person who struggles with anxiety that the peace of God that passes all understanding would fall upon them and would keep their heart and their mind through Christ Jesus. And it's his, in His name I pray. Well, God bless. I look forward to seeing you next time on Heritage Park Live.